And social policy. Yeah. Social. <laughs> A little different. Uh, just slightly. Uh, and Thank you, Luis, and thanks for all of you in person and online for joining us, especially during spring break. Um, I really appreciate that, and it's great to see all of you. Um, so today I'm going to build on um, my talk from two years ago that maybe some of you were here for uh, in pre-COVID days. Um, during that conversation, we talked about, um, are we having audio issues? Are we good now? Okay. <laughs> so um, way back when, about two years ago, um, I came and I talked about some of the constraints that families face as they're enduring important decisions around making neighborhood and school choices for their families. Um, my dissertation has really built that out, thinking about both traditional like economic constraints, but then thinking more about socio-emotional and cognitive constraints. And in this paper, which is a spinoff of that work, I'm thinking about the other side of the equation, which is how preferences may shape where people end up versus just constraints. So challenging the assumption, you know, that constraints are the one thing keeping everyone from integrating into certain neighborhoods and schools thinking more about probing why do certain groups of people have different sets of preferences when they approach similar decisions, okay? So just as I did in my last talk, I wanna kind of situate um, this talk in, um, in kind of the evolving uh, dynamics of residential and educational decision-making um, and segregation um, from the mid 20th century on. So there's a really rich literature in sociology and elsewhere that documents the pre-1990s environment that led to segregation. So if we think about economic and racial inequality and bias, these are that's obviously a key through line during this period of time in shaping segregation by neighborhood and school. We know that paternalistic policies that emerged in the mid 20th century helped to exacerbate these problems. So concentrated poverty and discrimination were key features of the mid 20th century city. Um, high rise public housing is a good example of how these paternalistic paternalistic policies um, led to the concentration of disadvantaged households within particular places. And during this era, we used to think of neighborhoods and school conditions being very tightly linked. So this was before the era of school choice. This is when zone schools were really predominant. We know that there was inequitable school funding that was of course correlated with kind of the household socioeconomic composition of the neighborhood. Um, and there were limited school options beyond the traditional public school sector though there were some um, students going to private schools. So we tend to think about these mechanisms as all producing and reproducing segregation, but the challenge for literature now is to think about what's happened since. So do the models that we came up with in the mid 20th century and onward from the truly disadvantaged onward, do they still hold or has there been an evolution in how segregation has unfolded? So we know that today economic and racial inequality and bias our common, our, um, sorry, consistent through lines. We know that still plays a key role in neighborhood and school segregation, but the policy environment has shifted. It's really evolved from a paternalistic approach to a, more of a market-based approach, right? Choice and, and, and purportedly integration are the watchwords here. And some of the specific concrete shifts have been the destruction of public housing, right? So we were trying to undo that concentration of um, income and race inequality. Um, we're trying to think about voucher-based programs as being a strategy to kind of unleash markets and, and preferences so that people are sorting into more integrated environments. And then open school enrollment and charters have also been a key feature, right? So instead of just attending your zone school, a lot of families are selecting to go to other schools, maybe far away from their homes that they think may be a better match for their preferences. There's been a simultaneous information explosion, which I think goes hand in hand with this expansion of choice, right? So how are people making these choices? There's a ton of information at our fingertips now as we assess the trade-offs um, that are involved with each of these school and neighborhood decisions. 
We have big data resources now that are being updated in, in real time. And if you think about websites like Great Schools, that has become kind of a defining kind of new platform um, that people are looking at in addition to Zillow when they think about where they wanna end up for, um, and where they wanna bring their kids. So the question is whether these transformations, which I argue are really significant, are actually producing desegregation as you know, their architects claim to have intended, or are we reproducing segregation through kind of a, a different set of mechanisms or a shifting set of mechanisms? And unfortunately, the empirical evidence is not promising. So during the same period when we saw choice and information expanding, we also saw residential segregation increasing. And we saw residential segregation increasing among the groups that you may have considered to be the most targeted by these choice and information policies. So families with children, this is from Ann Owen, Sean Reardon and colleagues, it's families with children where we see the largest increase in neighborhood income-based segregation um, in the United States from the 1990s onwards, right? There's heterogeneity by household structure. Families with children seem to see the sharpest incline in income-based segregation. I'm happy to talk about these measures um, in more detail in Q&A perhaps, um, but that other groups have been more stagnant, okay? So this is concerning evidence that at least overall, there hasn't been much of a decline in residential segregation by income. And in fact, for some key subgroups, there's been an increase. It, yeah. Yes, exactly, sure. So income segregation on the left hand, this is the, the Y axis, is basically looking at um, the distribution of household income across different census tracts in the United States, right? So you would basically be at zero if all census tracts um, had a household income composition that was the same as the nation at large. And as that distribution um, across census tracts kind of skews from the national distribution, uh, you get higher and higher, okay? So there's more technicality there, but it's really just comparing the national distribution of household income with the local neighborhood level distribution, okay? So higher is worse. Um, it's a little more difficult when you're looking at income segregation than racial segregation, right? Because race is kind of finite groups. With income segregation, you have to create a complex function to kind of figure out like how to kind of define the categories. Um, so that, that's the gist of it. Um, I'm happy to come back to that. And while we're here, I just want to clarify that since this is early stage work, I'm very open and encouraging of clarification questions substantive questions, whatever, as I go along. So don't feel like you need to stay quiet until the end, okay? So we just looked at residential segregation using a similar measure of school segregation, um, similar pattern holds. There's been a modest increase in school-based income segregation. Uh, and we see kind of a, an uptick during the time when information and choice um, we're expanding the most, right? So there's some concerns that at least at the aggregate level, we're not seeing the reductions in segregation that we had hoped to see, despite really substantial transformations of neighborhood and school choice environments. So here's the key question for me, which is with more information and choice available than ever before, why does contextual segregation persist? What are the mechanisms? This is especially vexing because large race and class gaps in school and neighborhood socioeconomic conditions, test scores and types remains even when we statistically account for what we think would be key drivers of segregation, right? So these gaps are not a pure compositional artifact of household income and wealth disparities between groups. Even when we adjust for those kinds of factors, we see residual gaps. So this gets into kind of the neighborhood attainment and place stratification literature, which I'm happy to talk about in more depth. Um, with more fine-grained analyses that look at spatial information and informational differences across race and class groups, that still doesn't seem to explain the residual gaps. And then finally, where my dissertation goes is some of these more fine-grained dynamics, such as differences in parental cognition and depression, for example, which may, um, you might think would affect choices, outcomes, and differences across groups, we still see residual gaps. So these are very persistent residual gaps in the neighborhood and school environments that children are being exposed to, and we can't quite figure out why it's such a stubborn gap. Yep. Yep.
Yeah, it's a good point. I mean, I think, I think recently in the literature, we've tried to kind of focus on the heterogeneity by household structure, and parents with families seem to be the place where we see the, the steepest increases in segregation. And so I'm not trying to address kind of all of the different household structures and how they add up to the aggregate. I'm trying to home in on a group that we think may have disproportionate um, effects on the overall segregation levels and trying to understand their decisions as it, as it pertains to neighborhoods and schools. Um, that's my subgroup of interest. I was just trying to kind of lay out the broader framing before here, but the rest of the paper is really gonna focus on those groups. Um, and these residual gaps exist, like if you condition just within that group, you see residual gaps, or if you look at all household structures, you see residual gaps by race and class in neighborhood and school conditions. Absolutely. Which is why I'm not trying to bite off more than I can chew. I'm focusing really on the processes related to parents with children. That's where a lot of my research agenda is focused. And I do that because um, I think intergenerational reproduction is an interesting process that has important implications. I mean, this is my third question. Okay, so I see the problem. No, I'm not, I'm not trying to make an argument about why households not a direct test of that question, whether households with children, um, like what explains their difference from all households. I'm really focusing in among households with children, why are there residual gaps in race and class, um, between race and class groups among the, in terms of the environments their kids are exposed to. I'm not gonna tell you, this story will not tell you why households with children are more segregated than households without children. There's other work like by Ann Owens that might address that question more. I'm really focusing within households with children, what's going on, yeah. Exactly, that's the thing. Like I'm interested in schools and concerted cultivation parenting and neighborhoods. Like to me, those are disproportionately salient for parents with children. Um, you know, doing a direct test about be between that group and households without children I don't know what, yeah, I don't know how to do that assessment because households without children are probably not thinking about schools, they're probably thinking about amenities and access to work. So it's a different set of, it's a different choice set, it's a different set of considerations, you know? Yeah, we could come back to this, but yeah. Um, there's heterogeneity, heterogeneity across multiple dimensions. I'm looking within households with children. So my argument here is that, um, especially relative to the sociology literature here, constraints are really not the whole story, that there's, much, there's a much richer set of processes um, that could explain um, the persistence of segregation between neighborhoods and schools. My argument is gonna be that parents of different race and class backgrounds exhibit, they don't only have different constraints they're facing, they exhibit heterogeneous preferences for particular school and neighborhood features beyond racial composition. So there is some focus on heterogene heterogeneous preferences in the literature and mo mostly, sorry, mostly focuses on minority avoidance and differences, you know, white parents wanting to avoid uh, minority kids. My point here is that that's well documented. There are other heterogene heterogeneous preferences that have not been attended to beyond that kind of racial structural dynamic. And I wanna probe what those different preferences might look like. And my argument to kind of push back on economists, so I've pushed back on sociologists a little bit, but I'm, I'm pushing back on economists here because I think preferences are not really kind of these independent features of the human beings. Like I think they're, they're so shaped by structural experiences that it's hard to kind of disentangle preferences and constraints sometimes because your preference emerges within a structural environment. And so I'm gonna give you a clear link about how structural context shapes the preference, heterogeneous, heterogeneous preferences, and how those preferences stratify neighborhood and school environments, okay? That's kind of the broad arc. Okay, um, at risk of doing too much setup here, I just wanna briefly think about like how we should develop a simple theoretical framework for thinking about how households' preferences and constraints determine their neighborhood and school environments. So if we start off on the preferences side of the coin, there's been this longstanding implicit, sometimes explicit assumption that the broad, the vast majority of households are looking to access, for example, schools that are well-resourced, right? Lots of funding with strong academic proxies and they're geographically proximate, um, for example, to their, their home of residence, right? They want schools that are close by, um, high income and at strong academic performance. 
The constraints in this framework are pretty simple. This is highly stylized, but obviously segregation leads to spatial differences in terms of access to these features on the left. Economic resources can also constrain families, especially if we're thinking about private schools, for example, and having tuition money that might uh, not having the tuition to afford some of these features or the uh, down payment or housing uh, resources to cover access to districts with those with those kinds of features. And then, of course, racial discrimination and bias can shape these markets in multiple ways. Um, in housing, there's a long literature uh, through housing audit studies about how racial dynamics among landlords can create um, these frictions. But in the school context, it's also possible that administrators and gatekeepers are keeping out um, racial minorities within certain contexts. Okay, so this is traditionally how we thought about the problem of segregation, especially when choice was first emerging as kind of an ideology for changing markets. And the idea here is that we could address these core structural constraints in various ways. So we could use liberalized school enrollment and charter expansion to kind of reduce that strong link between segregation and uh, the school options available, right? We could kind of liberalize that dynamic. We could provide housing and school vouchers that subsidize families so that they no longer needed to rely on their own economic resources to access well-resourced environments. And then we tried to, um, with mixed success, enforce fair housing laws and create a standardized school enrollment process that tried to be you know, race blind. The assumptions here are that if, if we have broadly shared preferences on the left-hand side, reduced structural constraints should reduce segregation because if our preferences are broadly aligned, we reduce these constraints, people start sorting into kind of the same uh, you know, desirable schools and neighborhoods. Unfortunately, there's limited evidence that these substantial policy reforms have actually had desegregating effects. And there's some emerging evidence that there's been increased segregation as the result of, for example, charter school expansion, right? We thought it would liberalize things. We thought, you know, these uniform preferences would lead to more integration. In fact, in districts with more charter school expansion, there seems to be more school-based segregation. Okay, so a bit of a puzzle for why that didn't work. So the literature has moved a little beyond these traditional structural constraints and said, maybe we weren't thinking enough about what I call thorny constraints, right? These are things that are more difficult to observe, but may also lead to persistent segregation. Transportation is really big for households, right? Especially immigrant households who don't have access to a car. It's possible that without addressing information, transportation or information, right? This is especially a hot topic right now. We need to expand and liberalize kind of access to information so that everybody knows what the different quality of different neighborhood and school contexts could be. Maybe if we address these thorny constraints that, you know, conditional on uniform preferences, once these are reduced, then we'll get to reduce segregation. Yet these are the new policy targets, but the emerging evidence is kind of mixed, right? So we have some evidence from Stephanie DeLuca uh, I'm Peter Bergman in Seattle that providing more information about neighborhood options does seem to close some of the gap, but not completely. There's been some experimental evidence um, on school choice that shows if you kind of create a very customized in informational intervention, will you get some minority kids into kind of better performing schools? And again, if you're, you're not closing the gaps. You're reducing them in some situations, but there seems to be a resistance even in the midst of a lot of these constraints being addressed, there still seems to be some frictions in getting everyone kind of aligned in terms of uh, a quality distribution. Okay. So the core research question is why do large race and class-based gaps in schools, academic proxies, socio-demographics and types remain even when these structural and thorny constraints abate? Why is this so persistent and what do we do about it? So my core intuition is what if this core assumption that even in the absence of constraints, parents seem to have a broadly similar set of preferences, what if that weren't uh, um, a reliable assumption? What if the attractiveness of each of these types of factors was actually heterogeneous by race and class? I'm not the first to make this argument. There are some old arguments from the 80s and 90s that did, that did argue that there was heterogeneity but it often came with kind of a cultural, um, a culturally oriented account, right? Like a culture of poverty or an urban underclass. And the idea here is that yes, there is heterogeneity by um, race and class, and it's because low income, you know, poor city dwellers, they're not as interested in kind of the strategic concerted cultivation, right? Like they they have less interest in kind of making the sacrifices necessary to get access to these features. Um, 
this has become a little less uh, jarring with this idea of future discounting, which is that you know if you're low income, if you're in a disadvantaged environment, you may just not see strong payoffs to making those kinds of trade-offs. Um, I don't think that explains what's going on here. I think these hypotheses are imprecise and they have questionable evidence bases. So I'm trying to develop an account of preferences that is not based on kind of these elusive kind of cultural arguments. Um, my argument is that heterogeneous preferences are in play, but they reflect racialized experiences in the contemporary American city. For white parents, academic opportunity hoarding, for example, by strategizing around getting access to high scoring schools may dominate considerations, but crucially for non-white parents, that logic may not apply. For black and Latino parents in segregated metros, crime avoidance may loom much larger to them than this kind of academic opportunity hoarding through high scoring school access. I think there are two key reasons why this is, might be a justifiable um, uh, hypothesis. One is that we know black and Latino families are much more likely to be victimized by crime empirically, right? So that's more salient. But what's also crucial is that they're much more likely to feel unsafe, even conditional on differences in their crime exposure. For black and Latino, especially women, their sense of crime and, and lack of safety is especially elevated. And if that's the case, and they're the ones making school decisions, I think that is kind of plausible empirical evidence that you would see their school choices being more shaped by crime avoidance than the idea that we need, I need to get my kid to the highest scoring, um, you know, academically effective school. Okay, so now I'm gonna build out the empirical case for this, but if there's any questions about the core argument, yeah. Exactly, and so that's crucial, and I'm going to try to disentangle that in my empirical models. Um, some of these correlations are not as high as you would expect. Um, now, that might be because of the measure I'm using of crime, which is homicide levels. Um, and, you know, despite this assumption that structural disadvantage and crime are super, super tightly linked in LA during this time period, it's like a 0.3 um, in terms of neighborhood disadvantage and crime. But I'll talk about the models maybe if we're concerned about linearity. I only have till like 120, right? Okay, okay. Okay, I'll still try to kind of move us along a little faster, but I just wanna give you some kind of falsifiable hypotheses here that translate what I just went through into kind of a testable set of propositions. So for white parents, I would expect significantly stronger preferences for school test scores or traditional kind of socioeconomic proxies of academic quality. For Black and Latino parents, I do not expect to see necessarily an attractive effect of these traditional indicators. Instead, I should see stronger preferences for crime avoidance that kind of uh, drives their decision-making to a greater extent. There's already preliminary evidence that um, parents do care about crime avoidance when they're making school decisions. Julia burdick will has some uh, arguably causal evidence that crime avoidance is driving some school decision-making. And Chantal Haley has some experimental um, results as well. If these hypotheses are supported, I think we have a clearer picture of why this focus on reducing constraints would be not particularly effective when we're trying to reduce segregation. So let's get into the empirics finally. Um, the backbone of my study, like my dissertation, is the Los Angeles Family and Neighborhood Survey. I'm focused specifically on elementary age children. So these are children for whom I think safety is particularly salient. Um, decision making is happening. Um, for these kids primarily by their parents, right? So that's why I think the parent is a key piece of the puzzle here. I'm looking at this period. Um, there were two waves of data collection for LA fans, uh, beginning of the 2000s and kind of the mid to late 2000s. This is a time of very rapid expansion in school choice. So there's kind of some, um, it, there's advantages to thinking about this period in particular. Um, and I have a really rich set of data that includes the school of enrollment for each of the children in this data set about 1400. I know what census tract they lived in um, for each wave. Um, and of course, race is crucial as a stratifying variable. I also have what I call a socioeconomic index and an information index. I'll talk about those now. So first thing to keep in mind is that because we're in LA, I have a very multiracial set of um, families. That's not always the case with a uh, panel study of income dynamics, for example. I think that's a nice feature here. 
Um, the other piece is that um, I have a really rich set of socioeconomic variables. So I'm not like relying on those binary indicators of free and reduced price lunch, which is often what's used in the education literature. I know about the household's time varying household income, whether they want public assistance, employment status of the parent, educational attainment, um, and some household structure features, which I use. I um, create one single index using principal components analysis, um, which is important for discrete choice models instead of having like to interact everything with all of these variables. It's just a kind of a data reduction strategy. So I have an index that combines that information into one socioeconomic uh, status score. And then this is also pretty rare in this literature is having like an information index. If information is so important, we might expect to see some of these proxies for access to information have a big effect on school decision making. Um, these proxies also use a principal components analysis uh, to create an index. I know if the family receives a daily newspaper, magazines, and has access to a home computer, given that digital information is one of the key pathways through which people are getting information about neighborhoods and schools today. Okay, so there's a lot of complexity here, but I just wanna show you that I kind of link my micro data to a really rich set of ecological measures um, that I use to kind of build a model of choice. So for every um, school of enrollment, I know I can link their identifiers to the California Department of Education's kind of uh, administrative data. On, I know if it's a public or private school in LA County. I know if it has um, a K through five enrollment, which is crucial here, because I'm looking at elementary schools. Um, I know the school type, I know how many kids are enrolled there. And crucially, I have the academic performance index for all the public schools. And the API is kind of unique because it's one kind of central measure of school quality in that traditional kind of academic performance, um, like test score based um, approach, right? It's very, very widely publicized. There's only one number for every school in every year. And so I argue that this is a very good proxy for that traditional opportunity hoarding based sorting. Right, that parents would be paying, certain parents will be t paying a lot of attention to this and other parents will not be, okay? Um, in LA County, I also have the catchment assigned schools, which is nice um, in the sorting model, I actually know what school they were assigned to. So it's not like this abstracted process. I can adjust for schools that um, were assigned by their local school district. So obviously they're more likely to attend the one they're assigned. And then I also, to take, uh, account of spatial considerations. I have this measure of network distance. So it's the road length and miles rather than as the crow flies to show you kind of how far away each of the school options are from their home of residence. Again, like as the literature moves towards this kind of thorny constraints, you need to account for this type of constraint when you're thinking about the choice set. Finally and crucially, I add in this uh, proxy for crime and this is crime of the neighborhood in which each school is located, right? So I, I'm not looking at the home of residence crime level. I'm looking about crime avoidance of certain where schools are located. And I use here from the LA Times, a three-year average number of murders. I think this has some benefits over other crime measures because they're less susceptible to um, like agency um, malpractice, shall we say, you know, or kind of fudging the numbers. Like homicides are pretty hard to fudge in either direction. And so I think it's a pretty reliable measure. Um, because it's noisy, I, try, I average over three years for each neighborhood. Yes. Yeah. So it's really just a control. It's basically saying like, I have, you'll see in my model that I just have like kind of a fixed effect for this school. Was there a sign school? Um, it's just a control to make sure that the patterns I'm seeing are not kind of disproportionately shaped by the fact that they're more likely to attend their assigned school, right? It's just to get a cleaner um, empirical estimate. So that's what my other papers do. Um, well, the, the paper that I presented when I was applying for the Monsuedo Fellowship was doing just that. So it's basically thinking about how parents make neighborhood decisions as a function of that AP. So I use this API index 
And I showed that actually, this was also a story about heterogeneity, but it wasn't clear if it was constraints or preferences that was driving it. Parents that were high income and high cognitive skills were extremely drawn to neighborhoods that had high API, right? So I didn't know how to interpret that. Is that because like they just are able to overcome constraints, right? That's what I think like the classic sociologist would say like, oh, it's just, they can overcome the constraints. Everybody wants those neighborhoods, but if you have certain skills and income, you can actually get them. But as Rob Sampson and I showed kind of in supplementary analysis, it's not just that, those types of families disproportionately said that they wanted those schools, right? Like they, like even just in terms of stated preferences, they said, this is really important to me when I'm selecting a neighborhood. Lower skilled, lower income families, probably because they have competing preferences they're dealing with, did not say like, I want to be in the highest scoring school neighborhood. That just was less salient to them. So that's where I started shifting from constraints to preferences. Like maybe it's not just, we all want this. Maybe we want different things and we're trying to understand how that shapes segregation. Okay. So yes, the answer is yes. I have a other set of papers that focus on the linked piece. You know, it's hard because yes, these are, we were just talking about contingent decision-making. It's hard to model simultaneously what's going on. Um, so that's the next step in the agenda is how could we integrate two different choice decisions? I'm not sure how discrete choice models would really do that, but let's talk about it. Okay, so how do I use discrete choice models to get at this? So let's think about a child I in wave P, one or two, um, with certain sets of traits. The child's race is crucial, as is the child's household socioeconomic index and their information index. All of these features are entering a decision process that looks this is kind of how the data are visualized, okay? So this is what the data set looks like. Every row for every child in a given wave represents a school option, okay? So I have a row of all the schools available to that student. I somewhat unrealistically, just um, for the sake of the model, I can get into this later. I basically assume any school in LA County is a theoretical option, okay? Public or private, they're selecting among almost 2000 schools and they're trying to figure out, am I gonna to go to that school? And therefore it takes a value of one, or am I gonna select one of the other 2000 schools, right? So for every child in, every, in a given wave, there's only one school that gets assigned the, the binary outcome, everyone else is zero. And I'm trying to predict that binary outcome as a function of school level characteristics, not individual characteristics, okay? So the core is thinking about, the core kind of intuition is, is this an assigned school, right, one or zero? Does that increase or decrease the likelihood of the school getting selected? As I just mentioned, it will increase the likelihood because they're assigned to it. But then I have all these other school level characteristics that I'm trying to see if they shape the school decision-making process. So distance from home, right? You would expect that the further it is, the less likely you are to get a one. Um, total enrollment, magnet or charter school, LAUSD, right? Perceptions of LAUSD may, may shape this process or negative perceptions. And then these are the crucial school level factors, right? I wanna see if academic performance index or neighborhood safety index are shaping this probability and whether these features shape the probability in a heterogeneous way based on the race of the child. That's the core intuition, it's not, it's not rocket science. Um, for neighborhood safety index, just to kind of clarify, this is a simple kind of transformation of the average number of murders. What I do is just multiply by negative one so that um, higher levels mean fewer murders, right? You'd have like negative, whatever. You know, like I'm, I'm trying to make neighborhood safety index be positive if higher rather than negative if higher. Okay. Um, so when we, when we kind of build the total data set, um, you end up with a lot of rows of data because you're multiplying all these school options by each child across waves. Um, so you end up with a data set of basically 3.4 million observations, right? So every comment, every child school combination is in the data set. Okay, so now we're gonna talk through the results here and just to kind of set us up, I'm not sure how many are familiar with conditional logit models, but you're basically looking at kind of within individual differences in selection, okay? So for a given individual, are you more or less likely to select a school based on these school level attributes? You could also do neighborhood attributes. That's what the paper I presented two years ago was. These are school level attributes and an odds ratio above one suggests that you're more likely to attend a school based on that feature, all else equal. 
if it's below one, you're less likely to select a school based as that feature increases or changes. That's the main effect, okay? So when we think about heterogeneity, the key is not just to look at main effects, it's to look at the interaction, right? So do we see an amplified or attenuated effect for academic performance index for whites as we expect, right? I expect odds ratio to be above one, which means whites are disproportionately drawn to API relative to non-whites. I expect the exact reverse for neighborhood safety. Non-whites become uh, more likely to select a school as the neighborhood is safer or if the neighborhood is safer, okay? That basic intuition works. Well, I'm looking at odds ratios and I'm looking for what's above one, what's below one, what's a push and pull factor for selecting a neighborhood and using these child level interactions with the school features to figure out what's if there's disproportionate attractiveness across these different measures. Yeah. I do. Yes. So what I'll, I'm going to take you through the model. I'm going to start very simple and then I'm going to bring in class. Okay. So let's talk through the results. Um, I mentioned what interactions effects give me. That's going to be kind of the focal parameter of interest is the interaction, not just the main effect. Okay, so let's start with the basics, just stratified model without interactions, just to kind of make sure that the patterns are making sense. So if we just focus on the left-hand side whites, as expected, assigned schools exhibit a strong positive effect on the likelihood of selecting the school. The further the school is from the home, the less likely it is to be selected by a white family. And crucially, the academic performance index exhibits a strong positive effect on the likelihood of selection, even conditional on all these other features that would likely shape the choice process, okay? So this to me is just suggestive evidence that as we would expect, white families like that API and try to select schools accordingly. Okay, let's go to non-whites. So what we see here is similar basic patterns. Assigned public schools are more popular than non-assigned. Network distance has a big effect. They don't wanna go far away if possible. Total enrollment, this is kind of just a compositional artifact. There's more enrollment slots available to those schools. And then crucially, academic performance index, it is above one, but there's no indication that's significant for this subgroup. There does not seem to be a draw of that API that's been so kind of focused upon among uh, school choice policymakers. That is not something that seems to be disproportionately driving certain families to different schools. What does seem to matter is neighborhood safety. Okay, so. All else equal, schools in safer neighborhoods for non-whites are, there's, a, there's an attraction, right? Pull, they're pulling students in. The API is not in this stratified model. So now you probably want more rigorous evidence because this is just a stratified model. It's hard to kind of make sense whether these differences are actually significant by group. And that's what I do for the rest of the models. Here, I incorporate those focal interaction terms I mentioned to you. So white and the academic performance index. Yes, significant interaction. Um, non-white neighborhood safety, yes, right? So it's not just that these are different in magnitude, they do seem to be significantly different. Um, attract, there seems to be a significantly different attractiveness of these features based on the child's race. Okay, I, um, I incorporate just basic school controls in this model, but getting to Luisha's question, the next model is to see whether these patterns are confounded by incorporating socioeconomic you know, class indicators. Um, with um, with each of the school level factors. So as you might expect, class and API do interact to produce sorting, right? So high income families are also, you know, attracted to high API schools, but that does not seem to explain the focal patterns of interest. You know, there may be some attenuation, it's hard to compare across logic models. You know, what I would say is there may be a tiny bit of attenuation by race, but the same, pattern holds. It does not seem to be explained by just class differences between race. And then you might think about informational differences by race, racial groups, right? Access to computers, access to magazines and newspapers. Interestingly, it's above one, but it's not significant in terms of that link between API, all else equal, the same patterns hold. Okay, so net of class, net of informational differences, my hypothesis seems to be supported. Okay, so now let's shift to a couple robustness checks because we're running slightly low on time. Um, so sociologists will immediately push back and say, well, API is correlated with racial composition of schools. And we know that white parents are disproportionately repelled 
by black students in school options. So maybe you're just the API that they're attracted to maybe just be pick, picking up like an aversion to percent black in the school, right? That's like a confounding explanation. So I'll test that. Um, okay, so we're both right. Whites are de de very strongly deterred by percentage black in each in the school. However, that does not explain the focal interaction, right? It can both be true that they're trying to avoid black students in the local school and all is equal that they're trying to find high API. So high API and low percent black, those are the types of school where you would see higher propensities of sorting, okay? So I think the hypotheses still hold and so does the minority avoidance perspective that's borne out in this data. Yes. Yeah, that's, I haven't done that yet. Like I, I've tried to hold off on triple interactions, um, but I think the next step will, you also might want to do that with um, race class API interactions. Um, so I don't have an answer for you yet, but that's the next, this is pretty early stage and that would be a next step. What would your expectation be on that? Yep. But you think my like API could buffer the, the kind of minority avoidance effect, like if it's a really high scoring school? It's possible. Yeah. It's right. It's hard to, yeah. I mean, I'm trying to think about how you model. It's hard to kind of really make sure without qualitative research, like whether they're sorting on the API percent black or both, you know. Yeah, the question is when they say, what do they mean by a more diverse school? Do they mean like non-black diversity? There's some sociological research that that's, they mean like Asian, maybe Latino, you know? Um, so it, these are hard to get at, it's hard to disentangle. What I like about my data is that unlike Chicago, for example, the API and school percent black are not nearly as highly correlated because, you know, the black distribution and APR, like there's only like 8% black at the district Le I mean, at the total level. So it's, you have less collinearity concerns here. Like you actually can disentangle those two factors. I couldn't disentangle school percent Latino, for example, because they're so high and that's so highly correlated with API. So that's where you think about metropolitan heterogeneity and how to deal with that. So these results may not hold in Chicago and that's a whole other conversation. Um, Okay, this is very in the weeds, but at policy people, education policy people will say, oh, you know, great that you found that there's an average test score, um, positive effect on white sorting, but that actually is not, there's no clear evidence that that average test score level actually predicts a good school or a bad school. That's just a function of selection, right? Like kids who come from very advantaged backgrounds um, are disproportionately in schools with high average test scores. Like we actually care what the school itself can do to propel students from whatever their baseline is. That's what makes a good school in, in kind of the most uh, rigorous conceptualization of it. So I create these value added measures of schools that show learning growth. Um, if we look at kind of three years of standardized testing, you know, some schools conditional on their demographics provide a lot of learning growth and others don't. Uh, I can get into the weeds there later if you'd like, but I think what's interesting is white parents, nobody is really sorting on those more defensible measures of school quality. They're going for that compositional API measure, which is really just a function of being around peer, like high quality peers, so to speak. It's not about like the school is necessarily providing higher quality instruction. That's a finding that's disturbingly common in the literature is that people are kind of ignoring those value added measures. We don't really know why. Um, and even when I incorporate them, my focal patterns remain the same, right? It doesn't seem to confound the racial heterogeneity I talked about. Okay, so just to briefly summarize and then we can open up for hopefully a few minutes. Um, I wanted to know why large race and class-based gaps in school conditions remain even when constrained to debate. My argument is less about constraints and more about heterogeneous preferences. My argument specifically is that whites have a tendency to think about attempted opportunity hoarding Right, so they look at average test scores as a pull factor for them. I call it attempted opportunity hoarding because it's not clear to me that sorting based on average test scores is actually getting their kids access to more opportunity. 
Um, I think if it was based on value added, maybe, but that's probably another set of concerns and papers is are they actually getting what they think they're getting from sorting on this basis? Uh, percent black is a push factor out of the school, which is uh, a common finding in sociology. And then the key here is that for non-whites, this attempted opportunity in hoarding frame is not gonna get us very far in understanding their decision-making. For non-whites, crime avoidance is the most salient feature. Um, academic proxies exert limited, if any, clear pool, but schools in safer neighborhoods do. So what are the implications um, for, you know, Luis was talking about like, are we talking about school sorting? neighborhood and school sorting or what, I'm trying to kind of broaden what the implications here could be, right? When we think about heterogeneous preferences and move beyond constraints, I think we can also illuminate parts of the housing market that have been difficult to understand. Um, my argument is that we should rebalance the amount of theoretical and empirical work that's focused on preferences, right? Rather than just focusing on constraints as we often do, thinking about not just racial heterogeneity, but I talked about skill-based heterogeneity, what are the different axes that might stratify what people find appealing about certain neighborhoods and schools? Um, and how do structural experiences shape those, those preferences? I think we have, need to have more attention to non-school factors shaping school choice. There's like a vast literature in economics that completely elides what's happening outside of the school, crime, et cetera. They're basically looking at applications to a bunch of different schools and they're only looking at school level features as determining um, selection probabilities. And I think that really misses the richness of these, these contexts that parents are operating within. I also would think that there's moderators to the degree of racial heterogeneity. There might be different types of cities and different types of places where crime becomes less salient. LA, historically, especially for parents that were there in the 90s, crime may be especially salient to them. It may not. In Chicago, I would expect it to be. It's possible in other parts of the United States, it's less salient. Um, and then when we think about policy implications, what would it look like to think less about um, focusing so much on reducing constraints to reshaping preferences? I mean, obviously that's a fraught notion, but is there a way to kind of lead parents to have a stronger desire to the types of places that might um, propel their kids' outcomes? Um, and the bigger picture really here is that urban and educational policy can't really be disentangled in the way I think we traditionally think about them. That you can't think about school choice absent crime, right? Or, you know, uh, concentrated disadvantage and, you know, in the words of Bill Wilson, that you need to think about them in tandem and think about the links between the two. And the most, I think, concrete way to think about this from a modeling perspective is what if our counterfactual scenario had less to do with what if we created a different assignment mechanism you know, within the school choice system, like a lot of economists have proposed. What if we what if we tried to equalize the salience of crime to families? How would segregation change in that situation, right? It's a much more structural intervention. It's not really about like an assign mechani assignment mechanism or the user experience on a school choice application. It's about really changing families' experiences day to day in American cities. How would we expect segregation to change within that counterfactual scenario. So that's kind of a next step I'd like to see is just in that very fanciful thought experiment, whether um, driving down that preference for safety uh, might lead to more integration, right? If they were, if everyone were sorting kind of on a similar basis. And for now I'll stop there um, and thanks so much. Thanks for bearing with me. I also have a question in the chat. So yes, Nicole. Okay. Are you sure? Okay. So Lydia has a good question here. She's asking if she's she's saying it's interesting that I'm pulling all non non-white respondents. Absolutely. Um, and she's curious about race specific, race, racial group specific heterogeneity, right? So if I disaggregated that non-white group into black, Latino, Asian, and other, you know, what what is the pattern I would see? So first I wanna clarify that because I'm so limited on um, my statistical power, that was really the explanation. So it was both a statistical power issue um, that led me to aggregate all groups. And also I think the theory is really a white, non-white binary, but um, I did check the specific groups. The patterns are, are, are pretty much the same across all of those groups. I don't quite get to, um, to conventional levels of statistical significance because of the limits in statistical power, but the odds ratios are all above one for each of those groups when interacting with neighborhood safety. So 
I think I think the dividing line on this is really between white and non-white, rather than you know white and Asian versus Black Latinos, et cetera. Um, I would anticipate Asian to be somewhat distinct from Black and Latino, but I know there are relatively few Asian responses in LA fans. That's true, right? So it, it, I, I'm always careful about making inferences about the Asian subgroup here, um, but it's not clear to me based on the results that Asians look more like whites than Black and Latinos. Uh, we need a better data set for that. Okay. Okay. Great. Okay. Yep. Yes. Sure. Yep. Yep. Great. Yes. Okay. So, so yes, a next step will be to look at older kids. When you think about discrete choice models, what, what would, it, to pull everyone together would require different choice sets for every age group, right? So you end up creating even more complexity into an already complex model. It's possible, but I haven't done that in this study. I also think there are, for reasons you just outlined, reasons to think there might be different there might be heterogeneity, not by just by race, but also by age and age race interactions. Um, I, I go back and forth on this. When parents, I do think one thing we can say is that parents are probably disproportionately involved in an elementary school decision versus my, my guess would be for high school, the students' preferences are entering, carry a little more weight. I don't know. I mean, it's possible that based on their prior, prior experiences in middle school, um, and you know, a four-year-old probably won't have a ton to say about their their school preferences. You know, I wanted to get a cleaner estimate of like the parents' perceptions rather than the parents' preferences mixed with the child's preferences, which makes interpretation difficult. I also think that parents are very afraid of young kids' vulnerability to crime. But, you know, I, I don't have a strong prior because I think you're also right that, you know, five-year-olds are probably less targeted by some of the crime dynamics in a neighborhood than like someone in high school, especially, you know, males, especially black males. So those, I don't have answers for those things, but I think those are all things that I should explore in the future. Also, a step, for, a step forward in this analysis would be using a richer set of crime measures. As I said briefly, I like this measure because Los Angeles and LAPD in particular have gone into these high profile scandals about um, massaging numbers. Um, and I'm concerned that it's hard to interpret what a property crime rate is in a neighborhood or even kind of a felony, you know, different types of assault in a neighborhood, right? Like, I just think sometimes it's hard to interpretation. There might be kind of year fixed effects that kind of change what's happening based on who's in charge. Um, and with a homicide rate, I have it from the LA Times and it's cross-checked with um, the coroner's office. And I just don't think those two entities have a lot of incentive to pump up numbers. Um, so there's kind of a reliability issue there. There's also just the issue that my understanding is there's not kind of a clearinghouse for data of that more granularity for every neighborhood in Los Angeles County over the years I have in question, right? Like you have these open data platforms, but they're often like 2010 onward. I need from 2000 to 2008, I need time varying measures and I need them for all census tracts in the county. So when you have those parameters, it's hard to get what you need. The murders are not so difficult, but I think I could do like a robustness check for the neighborhoods where I can get that data. I could say, you know, does this still hold? Um, yeah, not ideal, but the best I could do. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Right, so that's a great question. It would be hard for me to really get at that because I don't have really fine-grained data on commute to school. Julia, I would refer you to Julia Burdick Will at, at Johns Hopkins who actually focuses on like those GIS pathways to school. I do think there's evidence that the danger of the path to school 
matters. Um, you know, this is also LA where there might be a disproportionate number of people taking cars. So, you know, does the crime, you know, in a neighborhood that their car is traversing matter? I'm not so sure, you know? I mean, there's still, people don't realize, people still take the bus in LA, but it's, I just think that would be different um, from the levels in Baltimore. Um, but yeah, that's an extension that I think would be worth thinking about. Thanks. Yep. Right. So this is the neighbor, the neighborhood, not of the school of choice, but the neighbor, the home. So that that's a key next step for me is whether that neighborhood effect from their own residents is shaping the decision. And I can easily incorporate that into the model. I was thinking it's, you know, theoretically, I think if it's higher crime within their home neighborhood, it's more salient to them to get out, you know, into a safer school. So I think that's what I expect to see and it'd be easy to operationalize here. So I will do that next. The other thing I have, which is pretty unique, is I have perceptions of safety among the parents within their home neighborhood. So I would expect to see, if I see that initial effect, I would expect that to be partially mediated by their perception of safety. And I think that could give us even more richness in terms of the mechanisms that explain the effect. You mean, oh, yeah, exactly. And that's how I'm trying to, that's why in the sociological version of this paper, I don't really use the word preferences. It's like a, it's a frame, right? Like it's, it's a constraint, a frame is inherently constrained. And my view is that crime is creating these frames and constraints that may, economists may perceive as preferences. Um, on your other point, um, yes, I have, I can get all that data. So like there's, you mean the census tract of residents like public transit options? Yeah. I have car ownership. Yep. I know, I even know where the parents are commuting to. You know, I, I, I want to be careful of layering too much on one paper, but there could be a spinoff that kind of looks at those more fine grain like they're there. That's the thing with these decisions. They're incorporating the location of their employer, their, you know, the location of the school. Like those are all factors that shape and safety of both, you know. Right. So I guess what, so what you're saying is like, is there a time period effect? Like, do we see stronger or weaker kind of crime avoidance within particular waves? Yes. Okay. I'll, yes. Exactly. But the crime exposure will. Yes. Perfect. So a, a U Chicago economist just asked me that, and I, uh, and I said yes. I've run fixed effects at the household level, so exploiting change in crime over time, and the outcome is a little different here. It's a simple just uh, prediction, which I think you were saying, of exiting the assigned school. Yeah. So leveraging change in the neighborhood crime level, the higher the crime level is within a house within a household over time, the more likely they are to exit their their assigned school. For non whites, but not for whites. So I think upon final submission, I'll need to incorporate that because everyone wants like some kind of, you know, adjustment for unobserved confounding. And that's a, ni a nice one, a feature of the data. Okay, so I will make sure to add that in now that I know some people, not sociologists really want that. I know, I'm kidding, I, I'm you know I'm teasing. I like economists. Thank you everyone.